Hello, history lovers, and welcome to the Aztecs and the myth truth of human sacrifice. Okay, now, uh, for those of you that are actually taking this class, you have the handout, you sort of read along with me for a big chunk of this. Um, so yeah, okay, let's get the show on the road. An aura of lurid fascination surrounds our interest in the Aztecs, the people who, at the beginning of the 1500s, inhabited one of the largest and most sophisticated cities in the world, Tenochtitlan. In 1521, this great metropolis was destroyed by Hernán Cortés and his army of Spaniards and Indian allies. In order to justify this action, the conquistadors created a propagandistic tale of mass human sacrifice, inhuman depravity, and devil worship crafted to offend the Catholic sensibilities of the rulers of Spain. Later, later, pardon me, later chronicles by Spanish laymen, missionaries, and Indian converts, many of them overly zealous in their conversion to Catholicism and only too happy to reject and indeed destroy everything of their old culture and beliefs told of these things repeatedly and in greater and more horrific detail. The cutting out of hearts with obsidian blades, the piercing of bodies with spears and arrows, beheadings, duels to the death, and even the flaying of victims and the wearing of their skins by Aztec priests as they engaged in religious dances were all held up for examination to the primarily Christian eyes of European readers. The theories behind these practices are legion. <clears throat> Population regulation, protein deficiency, evidence of a warped and depraved societal sensibility, religious rituals designed to save the world from destruction by the gods. These are only the most prominent ideas advanced over the last 500 years to explain the practice of human sacrifice on the grand scale. But the most interesting thing is that while there has been no shortage of writing on these practices, what has gone almost totally unexamined are the sources of information that have proven to the world in history that such practices existed at all. So the question then is what are these sources? Well, the first of them is a gentleman by the name of Bernal Diaz del Castillo, who was one of the conquistadors that arrived in Mesoamerica with Cortes that marched into the Aztec Empire with them, into Tenochtitlan, that fought side by side with them all the way out the other end of the conquest, defeating the Aztecs. He got a tremendous amount of land and wealth as a result of this. He died as an old man in his 80s. I mean, if you live to your 80s nowadays, that's great, right? But if you live to your 80s back in the 1500s, it was like being a hundred, okay? Before he died, Castillo wrote a book called The True History of the Conquest of New Spain, Historia Verdadera de la Conquista de la Nueva España, A True History of the Conquest. And it, it's literally almost like a journalistic day-by-day, -day, I was there story of how it was and what it looked like, the smells, the sights, every sense is involved. It's an, it's an incredibly descriptive an engaging text. Okay, now having said that, how accurate is it? Well, he is our most authoritative source on the Aztecs and the rituals of sacrifice. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the end of a long life, as I said, and nearly a half century after the conquest, he wrote the book that would guarantee him literary immortality, and in it, Diaz spares no effort in describing the rituals of Aztec sacrifice. The dismal drum of Huiche Lobos, which is his version of Oitza La Postli, sounded again, accompanied by conchs, horns, and trumpet-like instruments. It was a terrifying sound, and when we looked at the tall Hui, which was what the Spanish called the Temple Pyramids, from which it came, we saw our comrades who had been captured in Cortez's defeat being dragged up the steps to be sacrificed. When they had hauled them up to the small platform in front of the shrine where they kept their accursed idols, we saw them put plumes on the heads of many of them, and then they made them dance with a sort of fan in front of Huichilobos. Then after they had danced, the papas, or priests, laid them down on their backs on some narrow stones of sacrifice and, cutting open their chests, drew out their palpitating hearts, which they offered to the idols. Okay, vivid? Yes. However, Diaz witnessed this gruesome drama from the Spanish camp on the shore of the Lake of Mexico, about four miles away from the city. 
Okay, now here's a painting. I don't know if this was meant to portray that moment. I think this is actually supposed to portray, like, you know, the first sight that Cortez and his people had of Tenochtitlan. Okay, but still, let's just sort of use this to get us a sense of context. Okay, let's say this is four miles away. This actually looks closer than that, maybe two miles. But from four miles away, could you really see what was happening off in the middle of this great big city filled with tallish buildings up on a pyramid? Could you see all of these? I mean, guys, from four miles away, I mean, how big does a person look to you? you know, from a hundred yards, like, like this big, that's a hundred yards, four miles away, they're like the, like the dot of a, like a pinprick, okay, how did he hear or see any of this at all, how accurate is an account written by an old man 50 years after the events that he is relating, relying wholly on memory, he did not keep a journal that he could then go back to, this came completely out of his memory, and perhaps he was anxious to write himself with God, get right with God before dying, right? Like, he can hear the Grim Reaper knocking on the door, and he's thinking, man, I'm going to die pretty soon, and maybe that wasn't the coolest thing we did, or I don't know, but I think I better tell it like it is, and, you know, consciously or unconsciously, out of anxiety or fear for his immortal soul, he's trying to justify the conquest of the Aztecs and the destruction of their empire, here at the end of this long, long life. I mean, who's to say? Really. But okay. Diaz was not the first to chronicle the Aztecs' ritual murders. The process actually began with Cortez in 1522 when he wrote a lengthy letter. Here it is. Letter of Relations. Having to do with the conquest, etc. to the king. The, a letter to the king of Spain who was also the emperor of the Spanish Empire, Charles V. This letter was his explanation, his rationalization, and his justification for doing everything that he did and conquering the Aztecs, because in doing everything that he did, he actually stepped outside the boundaries of the law in a variety of ways. Okay, now, in doing so, in bending the rules a little bit, you know, he conquered the Aztec Empire and acquired an enormous trophy for the king, not to mention all the gold that he sent back for the king and etc. But still, he wants to really dot his I's and cross his T's and explain himself and make himself look as good as possible so that there's no chance at all that the king will be angry, right? He knew that this letter would spread. It would not just be for the eyes of the king, but it would be it would end up being published and spread because it was such an interesting account of a distant land and alien people. These sorts of accounts had always been published and sort of disseminated amongst the literate populations of Europe for hundreds of years. So he knew that it would spread as Christendom at that time was all too ready to believe the most hideous lies regarding pagans and infidels at this time, particularly stories of Jews engaging in the ritual murders of kidnapped Christian infants. Okay, Remember, guys, it was only just a, a generation ago that the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and Portugal were under the control for 800 years of the Moors, and there were a lot of Jews there at the same time. And just within the last 20, 25 years, those Jews and Moors, the only ones left over after the Spaniards and the Portuguese reconquered the Iberian Peninsula, all the Jews and Moors that were left over, merchants, landowners, bankers, all kinds of people, just people, not soldiers, all those people were expelled, they were kicked out, they were thrown out of Spain and Portugal, okay? They were perceived as enemies to the true faith, to Christendom, to the Catholic Church, right? So there's a real, like a hunger for the story of alien peoples that are pagans, infidels, devil worshippers, non-Christians. This is good stuff. People want to read stuff like this. It's exciting. It's Stephen King. It's the bestseller list kind of stuff, right? So Cortez knows this. He's not only trying to adjust himself to the king, he's trying to justify himself and his actions to everybody that he knows will actually read what it is, pardon me, that he's written. All right? Now, in addition to Diaz and to Cortez, we also have the many, many 
surviving codices, singular, a codex, multiple codexes are codices. Codexes is not a word. We have the various surviving codices, all but one of which were produced some years after the conquest. These codices, intended as encyclopedias of native culture, were nonetheless created under the guidance of Spanish priests by native artisans who were newly converted to Catholicism and very, very committed to the Catholic faith. Does it not stand to reason that these accounts of pre-conquest life and culture would also serve to reflect the now necessary justifications for conquest established by Cortes more than a decade earlier? So let's explore this a little further. <clears throat> right after the conquest, like as soon as word got back to Spain about the defeat of the Aztecs, the king sent this character here, Bernardino de Sahagún, okay, a very, very prominent in terms of his intellect, very prominent intellectual uh, amongst the Franciscan order of Catholic priests. He sent with 11 other priests, the 12 disciples kind of thing, right? They are sent over with a specific mission, and that mission is to preserve, to write down, to record everything that they can about the culture and the history and the identity of the Aztecs before all of it's entirely gone and vanished into the mists of, of memory, okay? So like a very cool thing that the, that the king did here to, you know, to this empire that is that his guys wiped out and, you know, I mean, uh, thank God he did it. Let's just say that. I mean, so much of what we know, everything of what we know really about the Aztecs and the peoples before them come out of these codices, okay, these illustrated manuscripts, basically. Now, who is it that's doing all the writing and the illustrating? And, well, overwhelmingly, it's, it's, it's Indians who not just Indians who've been converted to Catholicism, but that are way into it. So it's fired up young people that have found the new faith, and they're like, yeah, yeah, and they're completely rejecting the old ways of their, of their parents, their grandparents, right? Those gods were defeated. The old world is dead. This is the new world of, of God and his son, Jesus Christ. And yeah, they're, they're into it, man. I mean, there's nothing like a fired up young convert, right? To a new belief system, a new faith, a new ideology. Now think about these guys as, as they are talking to the priest, as the old wise men are talking to the priests, the priests are learning a lot about sacrifice into the gods and what it was for and et cetera and so on and so forth, right? But these young guys, doesn't it seem like they could be could have been pushing an agenda? In other words, making the whole aspect of sacrifice within the lives of the Aztecs and within their culture, making it seem like a bigger and bloodier and more dramatic affair than even it really was, because then by making it so horrible, it makes God and Christ and Catholicism that much more beautiful and filled with light and goodness. And so you see these images, right, of sacrifice. Not to say that there was no sacrifice. There certainly was, okay? But what was it like and, you know, how did it play out? And, you know, those are the big questions that we need to sort of, you know, come to terms with. And for whatever it's worth over here on the left-hand side of the screen, if it looks like, you know, trumpets and various kinds of brass musical instruments down there, those are actually supposed to be the limbs of people that were torn off and thrown down the steps of the pyramid. Okay, now, uh, where am I? <laughs> okay, so there are the written accounts which are specious at best and not to be trusted entirely. There are also many pieces of archaeological evidence to support the existence of human sacrifice among the Aztecs, sculptures, frescoes, wall paintings, pictographs, and they've been interpreted to support the existence of these rituals of human sacrifice, but they're also open to re-examination with modern eyes. What could these images of human hearts, death, and torture, couldn't they be metaphors and allegories or images of the punishment of criminals or defeated enemies? Couldn't they be something other than what they were presumed to be 500 years ago and for most of the time since then?
symbols mean everything. And there are crucial differences of symbolic meaning between Mesoamerican societies, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Zapotecs, the Mishtecs, all of them, okay, and European societies, Christian societies, all right? Here you have Coatlicue, Coatlicue, she of the starry skirt. When the Spaniards were being shown around town, you know, out on the town at Tenochtitlan, being shown all the groovy things, they were taken up to the top of this pyramid to the temple of Coatlicue. And when they were brought inside where the sacrificial stone was, the blood from decades, generations of sacrifices, it was always, they didn't clean it up. It was allowed to stay there and dry. And then the next sacrifice more went down and dried. So the, the stone and the floor in there was just black with old blood. And, and Diaz said the smell was so horrible that all the Spaniards kind of reeled out to get fresh air. <laughs> and some of them even vomited. And the Aztecs were very offended by this. They said, what are you doing? Like You're vomiting outside the temple of our beloved mother. Coatlicue was their mom, their, their, their mother, their earth goddess. One of them said, hey, what up? you guys are a bunch of rude, no good SOBs. Like, what's up with this? Right now, what was up with this? I mean, for the Spaniards, twin rattlesnake heads, uh, skull, hearts, a skirt of serpents hanging down. You can't really tell right here, but big like dinosaur feet with claws. Okay, clawed hands up here like this. I mean, this is what is this for Christians? This is this is devilish. It's it's satanic. It's it's like something from the pits of hell, right? But for the Aztecs, it was something entirely different. First of all, they had no Garden of Eden story. To them, the serpent was not an agent of darkness or a symbol of evil or of the betrayal, you know, that man made to God and nothing like that. Okay, the the serpent or snakes in general were associated with Coatlicue, who was the Earth Mother, the mother of the planet that we live on and, you know, kind of takes care of us and, okay... And this image of her with this necklace, if you look up here on the left, guys, try to see these seven objects that are hanging like a necklace, okay? You have two hands across from each other. <clears throat> and then below the hands, oh, I forgot, I've got my pointer. <laughs> okay, hands, <clears throat> hearts, hands, and a skull. A necklace of hands, hearts, and skulls. What is this? What does this mean? What it meant is that man is capable of doing many great things. Let us give praise to the goddess of life, the goddess of the earth, who provides men with minds to conceive of great things, with hands to raise those great things up, to build, to write, to paint, to construct. Every kind of artifice is taken care of by way of the hands. Farming, everything we, we can do as men, it's because we have hands and because we have hearts, right, that keep the blood pumping through our bodies. Hearts, the sacred sacrifice to the gods, right? The Aztecs believed that the sun in the sky, Tonatia, was created because gods sacrificed themselves to give birth to that sun, okay? And that's why men were sacrificed, men and women, why their hearts were given to the gods, okay, to mirror that ancient godly sacrifice, which which created the sun and set it in the heavens. Okay, this is powerful stuff, right? But for the Spanish, to get the hell out of here where they, they don't want it, nothing, no, <laughs> no, right? They don't get this. They can't make sense of this. Now, what about Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, the ubiquitous sort of universal god of Mesoamerica. Every single ancient Indian society of Mesoamerica worshipped Quetzalcoatl, this, this idea of the feathered serpent. Okay, here you have the ruins of the Templo Mayor, or the main temple in Tenochtitlan, and you can see this Quetzalcoatl. I keep forgetting I have my pointer here, right? There's all kinds of them here winding around the perimeter of the foundations, these big Quetzalcoatl heads. Here you have a place called Xochicalco, which is believed to have been a center for study for the most advanced scholars, okay, amongst the Aztecs. This is up on a very high plateau, a very like raised sort of eminence. 
Here at Shoshi Calco, you have the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, right? Look at the body here, winding along the temple, and then exactly mirrored. Because, I mean, look, it's exactly the same thing, like a cookie cutter. And they did this with, with stone tools, like carved stone with stone, okay? Now, what is it about Quetzalcoatl that becomes so problematic? Well, there were lots of images of Quetzalcoatl where he is devouring men devouring men. Or here you have a man coming out of the mouth of Quetzalcoatl. Here you have another one, the Quetzalcoatl coming up out of a brazier, opening the mouth, and then the man emerging. This is a Mayan image here. Uh, this is also Mayan. No, this is Zapotec. And then this is Aztec. And this is Aztec. Okay. Well, what does this mean? Well, the devouring of men by the feathered serpent is not an image of horror but the image of a novice scholar being consumed by the god of wisdom, only to be regurgitated at a later date and other images reborn as a master, as a Quetzalcoatl among men. Okay, let me spin that for you a different way. When you went off to the university, okay, or the Kalmekak, you were symbolically or metaphorically stepping into the mouth of the God of Wisdom, Quetzalcoatl, you were being swallowed by him. He would swallow you, chew you up and choke you down, and you would make this journey through the innards of the God of Wisdom. And then once you had graduated, once you had your master's degree or your PhD, okay, then you came back out of the mouth of the God of Wisdom. And forever after that, as an honorific, the same way someone with a PhD is Dr. So-and-so or Professor So-and-so, if you have a master's degree, okay, what you might refer to, it wasn't like every day or all the time, but an educated man that had achieved that level of knowledge was referred to as a Quetzalcoatl, right? Ah, there goes Quetzalcoatl, Nezahualcoyotl. Ah, there goes Quetzalcoatl, uh, Moctezuma Shoshiotzin. Okay, it was an honorific to signify that this person had reached the highest level of, of intellectual endeavor. Okay, the Spanish didn't get this, they didn't get it at all. Okay, for them the bottom line is snakes equal the devil. All right, it's very simple, very straightforward. They were not intellectuals. Okay, these these Spanish conquistadors, they they couldn't see things that way. All right, now what about this? Shipitotec, our Lord, the Flayed One. A great deal has been made of Shipitotec as the Flayed God of Mesoamerica. But instead of a priest wearing the flayed skin of a sacrificial victim, might this not be the representation of a priest acting as the avatar of a divine presence on earth nestled inside the mortal vessel? Okay, now let's let's look at this for a minute. First of all, you see, here's like a guy, right? Arm, arm, hand over here, two legs, head, right? But then you see there's another hand, another hand. He's wearing the skin of someone. Here's the feet sticking out of the skin and the hands sticking out. I mean, I guess they couldn't make them so sophisticated. You know, if you peeled somebody's skin off and then tried to make a glove and put your fingers back to the fingers, they wouldn't fit unless you were like a skinny little dude like me and then you were trying to put on the hand of some great big giant dude like LeBron James or whatever, right? So, when the Spanish saw these images, okay, of the flayed God, again, you see the whole idea here, right? Here, here, here. In sculpture, you always know it's the flayed God. Here's the skin being worn. And again, here. But it's also this open mouth, okay, that always tells you. Sometimes you can see the other mouth inside the skin. Okay, and then, and then here you see the hands down on the bare hands, right? Then from behind, you see how the skin is being tied up back there to stay on like a costume. Okay, you know, we love serial killers and, you know, Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill, right? Dressing up in the skins of women. Oh, she's like a big old fat girl. Remember the way you talk? Put the lotion on in the basket. Yeah, okay. You know, serial killer stuff. This is like second nature to our pop culture sensibility. But for the Spanish, again, it was just <laughs> like a one-way ticket to hell. It's devilish, satanic, horrible, nasty, monstrous. Ah! Okay, but again, 
if a priest put on the skin of a victim whose heart had been offered in divine sacrifice to the gods, could that not be a metaphorical um, stance or, or posturing? Could the, could the priest not then be taking on the identity like as an avatar of the God, a manifestation of the God on earth. That's what an avatar is, okay? Acting as if he was Shippy Totek, the flayed God. Some people have also thought about the fact that corn, corn seeds, corn sheds a husk, right? When you eat a corn, you peel this husk off, you take the skin off, and inside is, is the essence of it. A lot of scholars think that that's what Shippy Totek represented, the idea of, of not just of an ear of corn, corn being the most important crop in Mesoamerica, not just the idea of an ear of corn, a skin with the important thing inside, but also just the idea of every spring there's a renewal process, right? New crops, all crops, right? Flowers, everything. Everything's renewed in spring. And then later in the year and fall and winter, things die and go to pieces and they fall down and molder. And then they come again in spring. So Shippi Totek is this kind of image or this idea of seeds shedding their skin, of corn shedding their husk, of flowers opening up to bees, of, of the birth of things, not, not, the, not the death of things. But again... The Spanish couldn't see it this way. They just couldn't see it this way. All these subtleties escaped them. They were horrified by everything that they saw that was associated or even remotely associated with the Aztec religion and its rituals and gods and temples and so on and so forth. <clears throat> there were points when they got so angry about things that they kind of forced the issue. They forced priests to be punished, to be burned at the stake. They insisted that this one and that one, this is before they captured Moctezuma and the seeds of Tenochtitlan and all that, but they had certain fairly prominent Aztecs burned at the stake. This is still when there's sort of this question that the Spaniards might be gods. So the god, Cortez, Topilson, Quetzalcoatl, again, a god on earth, says, execute these men. They've engaged in horrendous activities. Okay. So what do they do? The, the Spanish directed the Aztecs on how to set up a pyre and how to burn these guys at the stake. Burn them alive. The Aztecs went, wait, you're going to what? Burn them? Burn them alive? They're going to burn them alive? That, man, they did not get this at all. To them, this was the most cruel, most barbaric, most evil thing imaginable. Right, the same way the Spanish couldn't understand their stuff, the Aztecs can't understand them. But remember, guys, what's been going on back in Europe, you know, big time for a while, burning witches and warlocks at the stake. Sorry, I'm going to slow down on my slides. Or, yeah, anyone accused of witchcraft or, or well, of witchcraft, if you're a woman, you're a witch. If you're a man, you're a warlock, but it's witchcraft either way. Anyone accused of that would be burned at the stake. Okay, there are lots and lots of images of mass burnings at the stake, of one person, a few, this, that. And in every country in Europe, basically, from the 1400s to the 1700s, enormous numbers of people were burned at the stake. Okay, dig this. This is the best resolution I can get on this for you guys, but I think you can read it pretty well. Region or country, right, over here. The number of prosecutions, like in the Scandinavian kingdoms of Finland, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, and Norway, 5,000 prosecutions, 120 specifically in Iceland, okay? How many, or, or prosecutions, this many executions out of a population of, etc. It's got all the countries, guys, England, Ireland, Switzerland, France, Croatia, Poland, for God's sake, Spain, Italy, okay? This was uh, the easiest and best and most devout in the eyes of God way of dealing with anything that smacked of, of devil worship from the Spanish point of view, okay? But from the Indian point of view, but, right, they, they didn't know 
I, I had to make sense of this. What you've got here are two different cultures that can't really make sense of each other. Now, let's say that the Aztecs, or pardon me, let me start over. The question here is not whether the Aztecs engaged in human sacrifice at all. That's beyond question, because there's plenty of evidence to show us that every advanced civilization of Mesoamerica engaged in human sacrifice, as did most ancient societies around the world at different points in time. Okay, But aside from that, we know that the Aztecs subscribed to the creation myth of the fifth sun, wherein sacrifice was demanded by the sun god Donatia to continue the life and movement of the sun and the sky. And there are certain practices, both martial and religious, that are reported in too many sources in the same way to be open to doubt. The flowery wars of the Aztecs prosecuted for the express purpose of acquiring captives for sacrifice. The ceremony whereby the sacrificial priest would greet the victim as beloved son and revert to themselves as beloved father. And then they would flay a small part of the victim, like cut off the skin off a finger, just some little part of them. That piece of flesh would be cooked up into a corn stew, God Tlacataoli. And then it would be shared by the father, the priest who was going to sacrifice the person, and the son who was going to be sacrificed. Okay, with, with these things, uh, there isn't really any doubt over. Okay, but if the Aztecs did engage in human sacrifice on the scale, suggested by the Spanish and some of their Indian converts. Where then are the remains of all of those bodies? There are three numbers that come out of the oldest and most authoritative Spanish accounts for yearly sacrificial totals. One of the numbers is 20,000, another is 80, and another is 250,000. Okay, let's just go with the small number, 20,000 people a year sacrificed by the Aztecs every year. Let's do some basic math. If the Aztecs began this process around 100 years prior to the conquest, and they only sacrificed 20,000 people every year, then in 100 years they would have slaughtered 2 million people. If it was 80,000 annually, 8 million people. And if it was 250,000 people annually, then we are left with the stunning number of 25 million human beings sacrificed by the Aztecs in 100 years. If any of that is true, where are the bones? Where are the remains of all those dead people? <clears throat> Graves have been discovered in the Valley of Mexico within within a hundred yards of the Templo Mayor, or a mile, or ten miles, twenty, thirty, fifty, a hundred miles even, okay? Graves have been discovered containing one or ten or fifteen remains, or even like a hundred or so, hundred and twenty-five. There's a few like that. Generally it's one person or five or ten, okay? Where are the remains of millions of people? Most of those graves, through carbon dating, have been dated back to events prior to the conquest, okay? So, and, and sometimes even prior to the Aztecs. But guys, there's no way to explain the legitimacy of those huge numbers and the complete lack of evidence to show that that ever really happened. I mean, how can you go along with that, right? You guys have all seen these CSI shows on television. Where's the actual evidence? Not circumstantial evidence, not the accounts of newcomers to Christianity or the deathbed confessions of an old man trying to get right with God or the justification of his actions by the, by the king of the conquistador so the king back in Spain won't be angry with them over what he's doing. Forget all that nonsense because that's all circumstantial evidence, right? To really prove that a death was carried out of, of any kind of murder, a sacrificial murder, there's got to be some kind of remains. Then you can say, oh, they, they pounded up the bones and they used the... Okay, but for all those people, we, we have no evidence that they ever did that with any skeletal remains of anyone. But can that really account for everything? I don't think so. I was going to talk about it. I kind of forgot, but I should have talked about this with the right on the tales of talking about the witches. Just how... 
stunned the Aztecs were over the idea of this crucified son of God. You know, they never saw it in any of these really bloody crucifixes, but just the idea that the son of God would be nailed to this crucifix. I mean, man, they didn't, they didn't get that either. They didn't get that on any level at all. It's kind of a grubby image of Tonatia, the sun god, totally contemporary, not really related to history, but really kind of powerful just to look at. And then here he is over here with his tongue sticking out, okay? His tongue in the shape of an obsidian blade used to cut open the chest to take the hearts out. See his hands on either side with the claws? Those right there, those are hearts clutched by Tonatia, the bloodthirsty sun god. It's a complicated issue, this issue of not did the Aztecs engage in human sacrifice, but did they do it in the way that the Spanish said they did? It's a very complex issue. And I'll leave you with this. If you were to stop the average man on the street, hold out a $100 bill, and say, look, buddy, here's 100 bucks for you, free of charge, but you got to answer one question, and you got to get it right. Of all the ancient peoples in the history of the world that are associated with human sacrifice, who was it that really, they were like the king of it, man? They sacrificed more than anybody. I guarantee you guys that 99 times out of 100, the first thing out of that person's mouth is going to be, oh, those Aztecs. The Aztecs. Maybe it's time we, we took that big rock from around their necks. It's been hanging there for 500 years of history. Took it off, straightened about, right? And tried to make a little bit better sense of exactly what was going on with them in terms of this, this issue of human sacrifice. Okay, that's all I got, guys. I'll see you soon.